بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ما أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على نبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا ما نفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم زدنا ولا تنقصنا وأكرمنا ما لا تهمنا وأعطينا ما لا تحرمنا وآثرنا ولا تؤثر علينا ورضى عنا وعرضنا يا رب العالمين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And welcome once again to this special presentation of Zaytuna College, a pre-Ramadan special where we um, want to share our preparation for this blessed month, which will soon be up, up, upon us, inshallah, with those of you. Um, we, uh, last week, we dealt with the uh, fiqh of fasting, and today we're going to deal with the fiqh of zakat. Um, and um, uh, the things we want to cover, there are four basic um, areas that we want to cover today before we open things up to Q&A, to question and answer. Uh, first and foremost is the question of what is zakat? Uh, and then we we'll move on to talk about the different forms of wealth that are zakatable, meaning they are subject to the rules of what we call zakat. Uh, thirdly, we want to talk about uh, zakat on business proceeds and debts. And then lastly, we want to talk about uh, those people who are eligible for receiving zakat funds. Um, first and foremost, uh, we want to talk about zakat itself. Uh, what is zakat? And the word itself, as we know, is an Arabic word. And it fundamentally, linguistically, it means uh, growth and purity. Uh, and in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, خُذْ مِنَ وَارِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَحِرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّهِمْ بِهَا وَصَلِّي عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّا صَلَاتَكَ سَكُنُ لَهُمْ أو صَلَوَاتَكَ صَلَوَاتِكَ سَكُنُ لَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ سَمِيرٌ عَلِيمٌ uh, Take from their wealth a charity, a, a sadaqah, uh, by which they will be purified and made to grow. Uh, and bless them or send mercy and blessing upon them for verily your prayers and your blessing is a source of tranquility for them. Allah, he is our hearing, our knowing. So, of course, this particular injunction is directed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, meaning that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is commanding the Prophet Muhammad Alaihi Salatu Wasallam to uh, take from the wealth or the property of the Muslims uh, a certain a thing which Allah refers to in the Quran as a sadaqah, which typically we translate as charity. Now, charity, um, uh, or this word sadaqah, we would say, uh, rather, uh, the word sadaqah is connected to uh, other cognates, like the word sidq, which means honesty, or uh, some sometimes translated as, as, in, um, as sincerity, uh, and then also sadaqah, or friendship, some would say, as well. You know, and so we find in a uh, tradition, the Prophet Muhammad said, as sadaqah to burhan, that charity is proof. Uh, in other words, it is proof of the sincerity of one's faith and the commitment to faith, because one of the hardest things to do is for an individual to part ways with their wealth. Uh, without wealth, the human being cannot survive as we know, because uh, wealth is, uh, it, it com comprises things such as food, uh, shelter, clothing, et cetera, and without it, the human being cannot survive. Uh, and for that particular reason, Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi uh, he placed among the different um, uh, things or uh, think different matters of priority which would be the basis of determining the severity of a particular sin committed against another person. He placed uh, violations against wealth on the third level. Uh, in other words, uh, when you would try to categorize the type of sins which are most serious, he started with first those things which constitute the heart turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are things like kufr, which is unbelief, or ridda, apostasy, shirk, idolatry, which fundamentally is what constitutes the human being's heart turning away from God. And this is considered to be most severe for him and among other, other scholars because, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the human being on the earth to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to worship him. Uh, and after this, he place the violations against the human person, uh, against the nafs, uh, such as uh, murder and, of course, any type of physical harm that would um, make a certain member of part of the body inoperable, uh, among other things, uh, in, in terms of severity. Because, again, if the human being was placed here to, to, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
then uh, if a person takes the human being's life or um, it, you know, incapacitates the person in some particular fashion, that that in itself would uh, not realize the purpose for which the human being has been created. And then he says, after this comes the violations against property, uh, al mal. Uh, and the reason is because Allah, once again, he placed a human being to, uh, on this earth to worship God and serve God. And if the human being doesn't have food, uh, clothing, or shelter, uh, by which they are able to survive, then the ultimate all goal or aim of the human being's creation would not be realized, right? So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he considers charity, that is when individuals give voluntarily uh, to be uh, a proof of the sincerity of your conviction, of your faith, of your iman. And so the human being naturally is disposed to desire wealth. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Prophet said in one hadith, uh, that uh, if, the, if the human being or the, if the son of Adam had two valleys of wealth, that he would want a third, but the only thing that will fill up the interior of the human being uh, is soil. Uh, that's the only thing that's going to fill you up. So the human being's desires are limitless. All right? uh, we, all, we think that wealth will make us happy, but once we get one uh, the level of wealth, we want more and we want more and we want more. And so the prophet is expressing this reality. So the human being is, has to manage that particular passion or that natural appetite through sacrificing um, uh, things uh, such as their material wealth uh, to remove the attachment to worldly things uh, and also to share with other people uh, in this world, which uh, itself would um, reduce a certain amount of resentment, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So this commandment exists. And so mentioned uh, the word zakat linguistically means to uh, it means growth and pur purity or growth and purification. Uh, and um, sometimes we wrestle with the proper translation of zakat. Uh, some some people they translate zakat as a uh, as a religious tax. Uh, sometimes you may see it translated as the poor do, etc., um, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, and it, it's it's really a challenge to properly translate these terms because, on one sense, when you think about tax or at least those who are familiar with what a tax truly is linguistically or legally, uh, that this be, comes off as a bit problematic because a tax is something that governments, they impose upon their populations and especially the income uh, that, that they receive uh, is posed, a particular percentage of that income is, is taken from the population with the goal of, of the governments to produce revenue and the, the reason for that revenue is supposed to be to provide for the needs of those populations. Now, of course, all of us, we live in a particular time where we know that that's not the case, that often those monies are utilized uh, for many things that have way are beyond the needs of the populations that exist in the world. You know, and so uh, this is very problematic to refer to as a tax. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, a legislative authority does not, has not imposed a zakat upon us. And the only legislator that we have or rightful legislator that exists uh, for a believer is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, is uh, his uh, trustee uh, the, and the messenger, alayhi salatu salam. And that itself is not to say that we don't have certain obligations towards governments and governors. We do have certain obligations as well, right? But zakat itself is the um, religious obligation and the only particular obligation upon a person's wealth uh, that one has beyond, of course, providing for the needs of those individuals, we have the responsibility to, uh, to take care of them or those who are our dependents, you know, it can be our children, sometimes it can be our parents if they're poor, for instance. Uh, and um, so calling it a tax is, can be a challenge, uh, but um, uh, so, so in some regards, it's uh, it is a tax, you know, but in another regard, it's not a tax um, and because the, go the governments who take tax uh, fundamentally are taking that wealth and incorporating it into their discretionary um, 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 budget, which it uh, can be utilized largely for anything. But zakat can't, cannot be utilized for anything that a government wants to. The zakat can only be paid on particular uh, individuals, certain types of people, as mentioned in the Quran. Uh, it, it cannot just simply be paid on whatever the government decides that they want to pay it on. And in this particular, this particular regard, we find another, another verse in Surah Tawbah, which is a uh, foundational uh, verse as well, 
where it says, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمُسَاكِينَ وَعَابِدِينَ عَلَيْهَا بُمْأَلَّفَتِ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ وَغَارِبِينَ وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَابْنِ سَبِيلِ فَرِيدَةً مِنْ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهِ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ That the sadaqat, the charities, uh, meaning the zakawat or the zakat itself, is only for the poor and the indigent, uh, those who uh, work for it, to work upon it, meaning the tax collectors and uh, distributors of the tax itself, if we call it a tax, or we say or the, of the zakat, uh, and mu'allafa qulubuhum, those whose hearts are, are to be reconciled, and we're going to come back to back to this towards the end. Wafirriqabi uh, for the purpose of slaves, meaning to set them free, and the debtors, those who have debts, and those who are in the path of God, meaning those who are uh, actually actively involved in uh, jihad, and the wabn sabil and the wayfarer. So, 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 so this itself highlights that that the a government just simply can't spend zakat any way they want to. Uh, and that's to add uh, that um, one of the other reasons that some people consider zakat to be a, a tax is it because the uh, initially uh, it was understood that all of the zakat was to be paid to the Muslim governor. Uh, so in all of its forms, so their basic forms we're going to go over, inshallah, in a few, in a few minutes. Uh, and that be, of course, the currency or gold and silver um, 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 livestock and uh, farm produce. Uh, and so the zakat itself, according to the Maoki school, that is to go directly to the governor and we should wait for the tax collector to come, is only applies to livestock. It doesn't apply to that of farm produce and to uh, the currency uh, or the, go, the, the those ano uh, anomalous or to uh, or uh, um, analogous, I'm sorry, analogous to gold and silver, as we wanted to come to understand. Uh, and so for this reason as well, um, uh, these reasons, we would say, uh, zakat is not a wealth tax, you know, in the sense that um, uh, a wealth tax um, is a tax on personal possessions, uh, or at least a particular percentage of value of personal possessions. And, and especially, it's, it's not uh, a wealth tax because uh, at least in the certain iterations of it, so those who would say that the wealth tax would apply only to the to the ultra rich, rich such as the millionaires and the billionaires, for instance. Uh, whereas zakat itself, uh, you don't have to be a millionaire or a billionaire in order to qualify for zakat. Uh, and also because um, uh, zakat is not paid on all the possessions that you have, only certain possessions that you have, uh, and it can only be spent on certain types of people, uh, as mentioned before. Now, now, some people also translate zakat as, as, uh, as a tithe or tithe, sometimes it's referred to as, and is a 10% tax, uh, which, or a 10%, and we can say a religious tax, which goes to um, uh, that Christians, for instance, they pay it, and Jews, uh, I mean, Christians or the biblical, uh, those people who follow the Bible, Bible teaching on it, certain Christians, they would pay 10% of their income to the church. Uh, and this would apply with regard to what we call farm produce, because even in Islam, this same teaching exists with regard to the percentage that you would pay on farm produce. Uh, so anyway, so that's with regard to what zakat is and what it means, uh, uh, or a standard definition of zakat would be uh, It is a, um, a specific uh, type of property taken from specific property when it reaches a particular uh, uh, amount uh, and is to be spent upon specific uh, persons, right? So, so being property, right? Uh, in other words, is a wealth tax in that sense, that is, you pay the cotton on a certain wealth, a certain wealth, wealth is taken, a certain amount of your wealth is taken away, right? If it, is a, if it falls under the category of zakatable wealth, right? And that is once it reaches what we call a, a, a nisab or a quota or quorum uh, um, and it is only to be paid upon certain types of people. Now, once again, we're going to be studying from what we know as al-Murshid Ma'in al durri min al of Abdul Wahid ibn Ashraf. Last week we studied um, the section on fasting. Today we are studying the section on zakat, uh, which actually precedes the section on fasting. Uh, but similar to fasting, uh, um, zakat was imposed or made an obligation in the second year after the hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it actually believes to have happened at, to become an obligation at the very end of the month of Ramadan. Some say the 29th month, uh, a day of the month of Ramadan, that the payment of zakat had become an obligation. 
Uh, but at any rate, you know, that's uh, just simply uh, something that, of course, has no connection to, of course, our obligation, but just a, a little bit of history. So Abdul Wahid ibn Asha, in his Kitab al-Zakat, he first begins by saying, فُرِضَتِ الزَّكَاتُ فِي مَا جُرْتَسَمْ عَيْنٍ مُحَبٍ وَثِيمَارٍ وَنَعَمْ Zakat has been ordained in what is to be made of mention of. Right? Zakat has been ordained in what is to be made mention of. Real cash, grains, dried fruits, and livestock. Uh, in other words, um, there are three fundamental categories of wealth that zakat is due upon. Uh, the first, we can say, is the category of what we call precious metals, but not all precious metals, uh, in particular, gold and silver. And so gold and silver, excuse me, takes many different forms, uh, and the forms that are zakatable include what we call currency, uh, even though, of course, today we don't utilize gold and silver currency, but this is what was uh, um, the situation for much of our history. Uh, and when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was alive and when the verses of Quran were revealed that the common currency, where we call dinar and dirham, uh, they were in circulation. And for that reason, uh, it's believed that, uh, you know, this is classified or it becomes, you know, of course, the basis of us determining um, zakat itself on the basis of gold and silver, which means that that any other type of currency is uh, zakatable based upon an analogy with what we call the nisab or the quorum for gold and silver, right? Now, gold during the time of the Prophet, um, with the exchange rate between gold and silver was, was 10 to 1, meaning that uh, 10 pieces of silver, you, for every 10 pieces of silver, you receive one piece of gold, uh, of one, of course, minted uh, piece of gold. Uh, but once uh, the Abdul Malik and Marwan, the reign of uh, the Umayyad uh, Abdul Malik and Marwan, which is actually the, 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 the first time that Muslims actually decided to mint their own uh, specific Islamic uh, currency, right? His particular dirham and his dinar, uh, the exchange rate between the two was one to seven. Uh, so, and it was based upon weight, right? The weight of one compared to the other, you know, but during the time of the Prophet, it was 10 to one, and then that becomes seven to one later on. Uh, which some look upon as be sort of a sign of uh, inflation, but perhaps, perhaps, is, perhaps is not necessarily a sign of inflation, but rather just simply a difference in the weight between the, uh, we call it a dinar shari, a dirham shari, and that which later became the standard in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the nation, right? So currency, first and foremost, jewelry as well is subject to zakat, gold and silver jewelry. Now we know Islamically uh, that men are not allowed to wear gold. Yeah, we're not allowed to wear gold uh, um, um, le necklaces, rings, et cetera, et cetera. But women are allowed to do so. Muslim women are allowed to wear gold. Uh, and um, if uh, these uh, people or these Muslims are uh, utilizing these particular jewels, uh, if they're wearing them, and if you're wearing your rings, you're wearing your necklaces, uh, or your anklets or bracelets, whatever that you're wearing, then you don't have to worry about paying zakat on them. Right? For the Manichees, you only pay zakat on uh, those type of um, ornaments uh, uh, if you are not utilizing them or if you happen to be renting them out, for instance, to other people and making a profit off of them. Then at the end of your year, uh, of, uh, then you have to pay zakat on them. And of course, in another example of a type of, of course, within the genus of gold and silver is what we call buried treasure. Um, uh, or mined gold, gold that is mined, right? And the mined gold is different from normal gold in that the percentage of the payout is different, right? So if you happen to mine gold and whatever amount that you actually have, you pay 5% of, of that in charity, right? On the day that it, it happens, you don't even have to wait for an entire year before it becomes due. Uh, and but uh, you know, and the same thing for what we call so buried treasure, a uh as as well. You know, so these were all considered to be zakatable items during the time of the Prophet Islam, and for much of Islamic history until, of course, the economic systems change uh, and a new world order had uh, had had occurred. And so today, at times, there's a challenge, uh, whereas you have, um, you know, Muslims generally when they, they try to determine the value. Of, um, 
of the of the dollars which are equal to the value of gold or, or, or gold or silver or the type of what we call the type of wealth or currency that was that was dominant during the time of the prophet then they choose between either what we call the 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 zakatable minimum or nisab for gold or the or the nisab for silver most muslims they base it upon what we call the zakatable minimum for for gold so I haven't checked today, but uh, I remember uh, last year, I think it was uh, close to $6,000 you know, in savings that one would require before they would have to pay 2.5% uh, on your gold. Um, or in some would utilize silver. In silver, the threshold is even much lower, right? So for instance, let's say if an individual having to have $300 worth of savings for an entire year, uh, then they would still have to pay zakat on that amount, 2.5% um, uh, of it, uh, if that becomes the, the standard that that particular person is utilizing. Uh, some argue that the silver standard is better and actually is more sound because the, the hadith with respect to silver are stronger than the, the hadith with respect to gold. Uh, and even some say that gold or the standard of gold is only based upon a, an analogy with the standard of silver. So again, so this is the first of the three uh, categories of wealth that uh, zakat is applicable to. So we can say precious metals, and that doesn't mean that all of them, but gold and silver, it doesn't mean that diamond or platinum, all, none of those things are subject to the rules of zakat. Um, the second category of wealth is farm produce, uh, grains, um, which uh, divide into grains and dried non-perishables. Um, so grains would include um, all many, all the types of beans that, that exist, uh, you know, uh, um, it would be lentils, uh, you know, um, of course, broad beans, or it's all different types of beans, lima beans, uh, uh, um, the, the, the multiple types of beans, uh, and then the dried non-perishables among fruits, for instance, um, dates, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, it also include rice, among other things. Uh, and so, of course, most people don't have farms, and so we're not gonna spend too much time focusing on, of course, farm produce. Uh, and then the third category is what we call livestock. And, but again, we don't mean all forms of livestock. Not all forms of livestock are subject to zakat. Uh, you have basically your ovine, your bovines, and the ovine are just two animals, the goat and, 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 uh, and, and sheep. And then the bovines, we're talking about cows and moose, you know, which are placed together in a single uh, genus or category. Uh, and, and then also camels, so three categories, you know, ovine, bovines, and camels. Uh, and these particular types of uh, animals, uh, the zakat is only paid on them once you have a certain number of them, right? And so you're not going to spend any time today to really go over those uh, calculations. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, so fundamentally this means is that as we read through the, the text, that this assumes that multiple verses have been excluded from our lesson today. So for those who actually may have livestock and have farm produce, have large farms, and they actually have many um, uh, grains or, or types of fruits that they perhaps want to contact someone to find out exactly uh, how much they would be required to, to pay zakat on those things, right? So those are three categories, of precious metals, farm produce, and livestock. And so before moving on to the next slide, I just want to just make a, this basic point is that typically when I ask people in a classroom setting, either if I'm teaching zakat or I'm teaching something related to what we call basic sales or the rules of sale, buying and selling in Islamic, in this, in Islamic law, uh, I usually begin to ask them, like, what does it mean to be wealthy? And without fail, um, um, students say uh, it means to have a lot of money. Uh, but realistically, money, meaning uh, currency, it's just simply a medium of exchange. It's a medium of exchange that money itself doesn't have any true value other than the value that a given population assigns to it um, uh, or a government in our particular context you know, assigns to it. And that would include even gold and silver. The gold and silver, realistically, it, to be totally honest, doesn't have any intrinsic value, right? to be totally honest. Uh, it has the value that people have assigned to it, you know, like diamonds, for instance, what particular value does diamonds have other than the fact that people's all oh, they're rare uh, and everybody's saying that these things are worth a lot. So uh, we should have diamonds and because you can get a lot of money for them. Um, but realistically, it's not like food or like uh, clothing, or like shelter, or like furniture. It's not like a vehicle that one drives. Uh, um, uh, you know, even glasses or a computer, these things have direct benefit, you know, for the vast majority of people, if not all people, right? And that's not the same thing for 
uh, things like um, uh, currency. Um, and so, which really just simply said to emphasize the importance of, of changing the par paradigm that, you know, that if you own land, if you own farm produce, if you earn li own livestock, if you own real estate, then you're rich. You're wealthy. You're extremely wealthy individual. Right? Yeah. You're not wealthy on the basis of the number of, uh, of notes that you have in your pocket or you have in your bank account or the, uh, the computerized, you know, sort of uh, notes. Yeah, because at anything, at any particular moment, you know, if a solar flare happens, you don't know if we have contingency plans. I imagine we do. Solar flare wipes all those things out. And, and I guess that, you know, they have backup systems for it. You know, or let's say something like what happened in Iraq, you know, uh, poor, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he grant um, relief to those people and other people who are suffering around the world. Uh, but you know, when Saddam Hussein and his particular regime had been overthrown, uh, you remember, I remember seeing videos where people were rushing into the banks and they were coming out with these notes, uh, thinking that they were rich, but not understanding that they no longer had a government to actually um, back uh, the, the value of those particular notes. So it really didn't mean anything at the end of the day. So if you have wealth that can be cashed in, right, like again, a vehicle or a home, or you have a, a land, you have produce, et cetera, et cetera, then you're wealthy. You're not wealthy on the basis of how many um, ducats you have, as we would say, right? So, so this is, again, just only talking about what types of um, wealth are subject to zakat. So no other types of wealth are subject to this zakat. Only the value, right, the cash value of other types of things uh, are subject to zakat, and we're gonna come to uh, understand that very soon, inshallah. Um, next he says, Fil'aini wal an'ami haqqat kulla'am, or huqqat kulla'am, yakmulu wal habbu bi ifraqi yuram, wa tamru wa zabibu bi tibi wa fi the zayti min zayti wal habbu yafi. Uh, with respect to real cash and livestock, they are due every lunar year that ends, and grains upon ripening are to be sought out for zakat. So under the first and foremost, that you don't have to base zakat every time you get wealth, right? Meaning that zakat is not based upon your income, right? That's not, you know, the basis of zakat. The zakat is made, uh, is extracted from your surplus, your savings, right? If you have a savings after a year with respect to cash and livestock, meaning that uh, you buy, let's say for instance, you buy five camels today, uh, one year from now, you still have five camels. Um, and the tax collector comes, you know, he gets, you have to pay him one sheep, right? You know, um, you know because that's the zakat that is due on five camels. Uh, if you have 10 camels, then you have to pay two sheep here in zakat, for instance. Or if you known, let's say uh, 30 um, cows, uh, you know, then, you have to pay, um, you know, um, again, uh, uh, one particular, uh, one, one, give one away, or with regard to uh, sheep, you know, have to 40 of them before you have to give any of those away in zakat, right? But again, yeah, then there are different numbers, you know, that uh, as we go throughout that. Now, but with regard to cash and livestock, or with regard to gold and silver, or that which is analogous to gold and silver, um, that you have to pay on this every lunar year. Um, and with regard to grains, you pay upon ripening, right? Meaning that the harvest, right? the Quran says that you give its right on the day of its harvest, right? So, so once the dates or the, 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 the fruits, uh, the grains have become fit uh, or have begun to ripen or have fully ripened, then now uh, you pay zakat on them if they reach a zakatable threshold or a, uh, a quorum as we're gonna talk about as well. Then he says, dates and raisins are due once they are fit to eat. And in things that bear oil, zakat is to be given from its oil, but the grain source of the oil fulfills the obligation. Uh, so first and foremost, dates and raisins. So dates and raisins falls under farm produce. These are examples of storable items, uh, storable or non-perishables. Uh, and uh, because of that, for the Manichees, they, they make this a condition that they have to be non-perishables, they're storable items, uh, that uh, once they, you have a certain amount of them, then you pay zakat on them. Uh, with regard to um, those things that bear oil, and uh, these are uh, four uh, in the Maliki school. You call it al-zuyut al-arba, the four types of uh, things which are oil-based um, um, goods or produce, right, and the, which are olives, uh, sesame, um, um, uh, um, safflower, 
and um, uh, uh, radish. Okay. So radish oil, safflower oil, uh, sesame oil, and um, olive oil. So these are four uh, types of items. So once you have a particular amount of each one of them, uh, then you have to pay zakat on them, right? And so with regard to farm produce, you're paying 10%. Uh, I'm just going to mention that next. Um, and uh, if, 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 if these are irrigated by natural waters, you know, but if irrigated by machinery, then you pay only 5% on it. Uh, so, so fundamentally, we see once again that uh, this looks like a wealth tax uh, when we look closely at these things. But once again, we're talking about surplus. Uh, and we're going to clarify those, inshallah, very soon. Uh, so zakat is due when, right, you know, in summary. Uh, so with regard to precious metals, zakat is due every year, right? Uh, so once you have a nisab, we're going to talk about that after this, inshallah, uh, then you pay your 2.5% on, on that particular uh, precious metals, or in this case, was a currency, your cash. Uh, livestock, you pay on it every year, but farm produce, you pay only uh, every, at the end of every harvest. Then he, when, then he continues, he says, Ten percent is due on fruits and grains, or five percent if someone utilizes a tool for irrigation. So if they're using sort of water wheels, they're utilizing um, water troughs, things like that, during the irrigation uh, of those things and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that okay well uh, you pay less in zakat on that because you pay for your machinery, machinery uh, your machinery costs your um, technology costs uh, but with regard to uh, when you just simply utilize the water of natural springs or the rainwater, then you pay 10 percent because there was no effort an additional effort placed into to that for for you in that situation so again, just in summary of that, uh, you know, they, we pay on farm produce or farm goods, 10% uh, if irrigated by natural waters, 5% if irrigated with machinery. Five wasqs is the zakatable minimum with respect to both of them. Uh, and silver, say it is 200 dirhams. So in other words, when he says that five wasq is, is the catalog minimum with respect to both of them, what he's talking about here is with respect to grains and farm produce and, and fruits. Grains and fruits. Uh, that, um, and the wasq itself is said to be equal to what is called 60 sa, and the sa is a metric in the, uh, in the ancient um, metric system uh, in the Muslim uh, context. Uh, and, you know, and there are dis 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 different, different opinions about how much that would be in, in our terms, you know. So, for instance, if we wanted to tr transfer this into uh, kilograms, depending on the type of crop, you know, you will find anything from between 450 kilos and about 648 kilos or 650 kilos, right, depending uh, on the situation. So let's say if we sort of say like it's about 600 kilos, 610 kilos, let's say for, of, of raisins or of dates, then you have to pay 10% on those uh, on those crops, all right, if, it is, if they're irrigated by natural waters uh, or if with machinery, then 5% have to be paid on the crop. Uh, and so, so that's what he means by five wask is the zakatable minimum with respect to both of them. And silver, say it is 200 dirhams. So 200 dirhams uh, with regard to silver. Uh, and then 20 dinars is the zakatable minimum in gold. And 2.5% is compulsory in both forms of real cash. Right, and so to summary, summarize this, we see here that farm goods, you know, you pay, uh, of course, uh, we have to wait until it reaches five wask, which is about 600 kilograms of each particular crop. Uh, with regard to dirhams, you're talking about your silver currency, 200 dirhams, which um, again, depending on, uh, let's say if we're utilizing silver bullion or the value of silver bullion in the market, you know, um, I, I remember about a year ago, it was about maybe $300, right, uh, worth of uh, silver, it's about 200 dirhams, about $300. And so really we're talking about, about, close to 600 grams of silver, 
Uh, and then with respect to gold, uh, 20 dinars, which in our terms is about 85 grams of gold. 85 grams of gold is like 20 dinars. And so about a year ago, it was about $6,000 in order to buy that. Say about three ounces. About three ounces of gold was about $6,000. So if you have that amount in savings, then you have to pay 2.5% on that if you're utilizing the gold standard. If, you, if you're utilizing the silver standard, then you are technically uh, um, eligible or obligated to pay zakat, uh, even if you have something as low as three or $400. Uh, in savings, and you've had that for an entire year. And then he transitions to a somewhat different topic. So he says, When Ardu the Tejri Wadenuman Adar, Pimatu Hak and Aini Thumma Bhatikar, Zakka, Likabi Thumman and Odeni, Ainan Bishopt al Hori Lid Aslani. As for the item of commerce and the debt owed by the one with a rotating inventory of goods, the Zakatable minimum value of them is the same as for real cash. But the one who withholds his inventory until the risk to, until the rise of market costs pays a cut upon receiving payment or a debt owed to him in real cash with the condition of the passing of the lunar year for both foundations of cash. So what does that mean? Um, fundamentally, what he's talking about here uh, are, are, is the cut on trade goods and, and debts. All right, so what he alluded to here were two different types of trade. Okay. One type of trade in Arabic known as uh, um, um, uh, the tijara uh, idara and the other tijara uh, ihtikar. Trade in necessity goods and then trade in luxury goods. Now, necessity good doesn't, doesn't mean the things that you can't live without, right? It's basically talking about goods which are readily available, right? You know, on a regular basis, they're rotating goods that, you know, you go to a market and they're constantly restocking these things. Uh, and so if you actually are in a business and you have goods that you trade on the basis of a transactional or sort of a rotating basis, uh, then uh, there's a certain rule with regard to zakat on that type of good. And then secondly, if you're into luxury goods, goods and these are special goods, specialized goods or goods that really they have high demand placed upon them and you don't, they're not readily available in the market. These are things that you hold on to, wait until a high demand. And so then you could maximize your profits. Uh, so it all depends on the type of good that you uh, actually own, right? And so your profits are based upon uh, the different type of transaction or trade that you're involved in, right? So, so this is the first thing that he, that he deals with is that, you know, that there are two different types of trade that we are, we are, we are talking about. And so with regard to uh, the, the trade in necessity goods, uh, zakat is paid annually on this. So for instance, uh, if I own, again, coming back to, let's say a supermarket, I own a supermarket and I have these goods, uh, they have to be very uh, meticulous about inventory. Right? Um, you know, I purchased these goods and I've had them right, for, let's say, a year. Uh, they say they were in and out. I got paid for them and I got new ones. I got paid in. So a whole year goes by. I have to keep track of how much money I made off of each particular good. Now, even at the end of the year, if I don't have any uh, of the money that I made from those goods, you still are obligated to pay zakat on the value that you earned that particular year on, the, on those goods. And so and the value will be the same as that would be for gold and silver currency, which is 2.5 percent of that particular um, of that those particular goods. Uh, if you are a luxury trader or a trader in luxury goods, on the other hand, and, and again, we're talking about an individual who actually is selling things that are not readily available in the market. Let's say if you're a diamond seller, let's say if you, um, again, sell gold or you sell anything that um, basically it's um, um, something that is not readily available or you hold on to uh, as you wait for high demand into, in order to maximize profits, then in that situation, you only pay the cut on those goods once you receive payment right, for them, right? Once you receive payment for them, it could be after three years, five years, whenever the payment comes, right? You only pay the cut for a single year on them. You don't pay for multiple years on, that, on those type of goods. You know? So these are different types of goods we're talking about here and different types of zakat. And, and it relates to, it can be a debt that's owed to you, uh, or it can just simply be the profit that you made 
uh, from them during that, that particular year. Then he says, uh, right. Well, he didn't say this right immediately after this, but you know, I skipped multiple verses because those verses that followed were related to uh, the different types of livestock as mentioned before. Camels, cows, um, uh, the different types of camel, of course, the dromedaries and the bacterian camels, and then the cows and moose, uh, the, uh, the um, sheep and goat, uh, and the different, uh, we call the unsiba, uh, the zikatable threshold for them. Uh, and so then he makes this statement, and the lunar year that passes for monetary gains and offspring of livestock is the same lunar year stipulated for the sources of gain and offspring in paying zakat. In other words, what this means is that uh, let's say that um, let's say, if, let's say, for instance, we talk about livestock first and foremost. We haven't because we're not really planning to talk much about that today. But let's say again, uh, five. Uh, you have to have at least five camels before you have to pay zakat on it. Let's say you have five camels. Let's say. You know, or but at the start of year you didn't have before whole year you didn't have five camels. You had three camels, uh, and let's say during that year, two of your camels gave birth to to two children. Um, uh, now you have five, right? Let's say yeah, we have five camels, right? You know, so at ten months you only had three, and at the end of twelve months, now you have five. That fundamentally, what this is saying is that even though you haven't had five for an entire year. Since those two camels are the yield of the three that you owned, that you now have to pay zakat for that particular year, right, on those five camels. Uh, and similar to this would be, let's say, for instance, that uh, you, you own uh, currency, you have uh, wealth, and you own a business. Uh, and let's say that your profit was, um, again, let's say that uh, your, your profit was, you know, um, and it's probably unlikely, but, you know, and it could happen, you know, uh, certain people don't really make much money or profit, you know, depending on what type of business they have or it's a nonprofit. Let's say, for example, a person only makes $5,000 in, in one given year, and that's actually counts as profit. Uh, but the nisab, but the accountable minimum is $6,000, right? Yeah, you know, but um, 10 months, at 10 months, you had $5,000. Uh, and then... Um, some one of the items sold during uh, the last two months prior to the end of that year. So now you have six thousand. We have seven thousand dollars. Right now, in that situation, uh, now you would have to be uh, you have to 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 actually um, pay two point five percent on your your profits now at the end of that year, rather than waiting until in a, in a different year later. But then he says, but an unanticipated gains at thari la amma yuzaka an yahul. But unanticipated gains that come not from what zakat is due, which complete the zakatable minimum, are to mark the beginning of a new lunar year. Now, what it means by this is what in the Arabic language is called al-fa'ida, or in the books of fiqh, they call it fa'ida. And so the fa'ida, or the tari, this is, they say, for instance, things that come into your possession or to your ownership, not because of your own personal effort, but they're, they come in the form of gifts, or it can be something like inheritance wealth, right? Uh, so going back to the initial example, let's say that, um, you know, that I had 5,000 in profit from my business and then all of a sudden somebody uh, gifted me $10,000. That basically what this is saying is that that additional $10,000, although it brings me over the threshold now, that for that year, I don't have to pay zakat. Why? Because that money did not come into my possession through my own efforts. It came into my, come into my possession because of uh, a gift being given to me. So I'm exempt from the zakat this year. And so, but if next year I still have the nisab, then now I would have to pay 2.5% on it. So this is what these, uh, this verse or these two verses are actually um, speaking of, right? And so on this, this is definitely a slide which, um, which becomes the basis of summarizing that, you know, so we have property growth and then we have what's called pro uh, profit. Property gr growth can come from your own efforts or it can come from uh, someone gifting you something which was not the result of your own uh, efforts, right? And so uh, the latter is not accountable until the following year, uh, whereas the former is to be uh, included in that.
And then he says, وَلَا يُزَكَّى وَقَّصٌ مِّنَ الْعَامِ كَذَاكَ مَا دُونَ النِّصَابِ وَالْيَعُمْ وَعَاسِرٌ فَاكِهَةٌ مَعَ الْخُضَرُ إِذْ هِيَ فِي الْمُقْتَاتِ مِمَّا يُدَّخَرُ And a supply of livestock between two zakatable limits is not to be taxed for zakat. And so what it means by the zakatable limits for livestock, you know, again, we haven't been dealing with this, you know, but um, unlike currency and farm produce, there's something called as al you know, or the zakatable limits, or there are two or more zakatable limits. So, so in other words, uh, the first zakatable limits for camels we talked about before we said it's five. You have five camels, you have to pay one sheep. Uh, the next zakatable limit is 10, right? Which you have to pay now two sheep. Why? Because now you have 10 camels. So in other words, what it means that there's no zakat to be paid between the two zakatable limits is to say that once I have five camels, then I owe one sheep. If I have six camels, I still only one sheep. I owe only one sheep. I have seven camels, I still only I owe one sheep. If I have eight camels, I owe only one sheep in zakat. I have nine camels, I owe only one sheep in zakat. But once I have ten camels, now I have now that I owe two. Right? So between uh, five, uh, between ten and and, and five, uh, there was nothing additional due, right, in terms of zakat. Right? So this is called this a zakatable uh, limit or a wakas. Uh, and, and it applies only to livestock. It doesn't apply to farm produce. It doesn't apply to, apply to currency or gold and silver, uh, things uh, related to gold and silver. Then he says the same applies to what is below the zakatable limit. Or the, the same applies to what is below the minimum zakatable limit. And let it be apply, let it apply universally to all things that, that zakat apply. In other words, what he, says, what he means by this is that the same thing applies here, that, is that there's no zakat. If you don't possess what is called nisab, right, which is the zakatable lim limit or minimum zakatable limit, right. So if you are utilizing the standard for gold, let's say six thousand dollars in savings, then you pay zakat. But if you have less than that, then you don't have to pay zakat. Uh, uh, if it's silver, if you have, if it's say, if it's three hundred, it, you know, you pay zakat. If it's less than that, then you hold, don't have to pay zakat. Uh, and no zakat is taken from honey perishable fruits and vegetables since it applies only to what is life-sustaining from what food that is subject to being stored away. And so in the Malki school, you know, that zakat is not paid on all types of farm produce, only certain types of farm produce. In particular, farm produce, which is non-perishable, you know, um, and even though something like honey is not necessarily perishable, right, it's not due on that either, uh, but also is not due on like things like apples or oranges, et cetera, et cetera, nor on vegetables. You know, that zakat is not due on those type of things um, because of him saying that they apply to things that are life-sustaining and, and can be stored away. They can be stored away for a period of time. And the zakatable minimum may result from two kinds of one category, like gold and silver from the category of real cash. In other words, they say that if a person owned gold currency and then and also owned uh, silver currency. We learned before that the zakatable minimum for gold is 20 dinars and for silver is 200. But let's say I've only owned, I only own. 15 dinars, and I own, let's say, excuse me, of, um, of, of, of dirhams, of silver. Uh, I own, let's say, um, uh, uh, let's say 100, right? So 100, right? So, uh, uh, and so, so fundamentally, what he's saying is that you, you don't say that, well, this individual is not obligated to pay zakat because he doesn't have the nisab of of gold, which is two, which is twenty, and he doesn't have many solid silver, which is two hundred. He only has one hundred. Right? They said no, that you combine them together because they belong to the same genus, although not to the same species. Right? So, so you bring them together, and you still have to pay zakat on uh, on both of them together. And the same thing will apply to the others, as he mentioned. And it can happen with sheep for goats. Right? So because they belong to the same genus but not the same species. Right? So it may have, let's say, you have. Uh, 30 sheep and, and 10 goat. 
right? Now, 40 is the number, right? It's the proper number before you have to pay anything on sheep and goat in that particular category. So, so one may say, well, I don't have to pay zakat this year because I only have 30 sheep and I have only 10 goat. You know, you're supposed to have 40 of each individual. Like, no, you combine the two of them. They belong to the same genus. And so you pay your zakat on your 40 uh, of those that belong to the same genus. And bacterian camels for Arabian camels, uh, same thing. And cows are joined to buffalo to bring into one another's company. Right? So joamis, you get buffalo, sometimes you say moose. Uh, so, so fundamentally what happens here is the same thing. Right? You know, so for cows, you're supposed to have 30, you may have 20, and you have 10 buffalo. Or for camels, you may have, uh, again, one, uh, uh, one dromedary and four bac 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 bacterian camels uh, or... Um, uh, yeah, 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 you have one or the other, both of them together there, they're mixed up. You know, if you, it reaches the proper number, which is you, then you pay zakat on them. Uh, wheat is brought together with standard barley and to, and to barley a thin husk. The same is for legumes, raisins, and dried fruit. So same thing for, you get the point, you get the point. So all these are things, although different, they belong to the same genus. And just because you don't have a full um, volume with respect to one particular species doesn't mean that you are not obligated to pay zakat, rather you combine them and then zakat is to be paid from them as a uh, unified category. And then he says, as we move closer to the uh, close, uh, we have a couple more slides. So he says, مَصْرِفُ الْفَقِيرُ وَمَسْكِينُ غَاسٍ وَإِسْقٌ عَامِلٌ مَدِينُ مُؤَلَّفُ الْقَلْبِ مُمُحْتَاجٌ غَرِيبٌ أَحْرَارُ إِسْلَامٍ وَلَمْ يُقْبَلْ مُرِيد the objects of his payment are the needy, the utterly destitute, soldiers for manumission of believing slaves, for collectors and dispensers of the zakat tax, those who lawfully incurred debts, uh, one whose heart is to be reconciled towards Islam, a needy wayfarer, both the needy and the utterly destitute are to be free men of the religion of Islam, and a dubious character is not accepted in his claim of poverty. So in other words, um, this gives us what we call the eight recipients of zakat. Zakat can only be paid to one or more of these categories of people, or if we can extend, potentially extend it to others uh, based upon the linguistic uh, similarity, uh, then that's a different story altogether, right? Or perhaps in the ling legalistic uh, similarity, right? Based on analogy. So first is what we call the faqir, the poor, which is just defined or translated here as the poor. Uh, but a poor person uh, in the miskin, Allah mentions in the verse two different types of poor person, the faqir and the miskin. For the poor and the indigent. And it said that the second type of poor person is much more destitute than the first person. Uh, examples given have been that, for instance, the, the difference is that the faqir is an individual let's say, who has um, enough to last them uh, for uh, the year or some the month for the month, uh, whereas the indigent may be an individual who doesn't have enough to last them for the day, right? If, if, just by example, right? Um, or the poor person, the individual has uh, enough for, uh, for their basic needs, but the indigent is an individual who doesn't have anything, not even their basic needs. So the sadaqat, the charities or the um, zakat is to be paid to the poor and the indigent. Uh, those two, two people, two types of people. Third, tax collectors themselves. So a portion of zakat can be utilized to pay for the uh, salary of the individual who is responsible to collect the zakat and to distribute it right, as well. So this is mentioned in the Quran. So this person can be poor or not poor, it doesn't matter, right? That it can be paid to that individual. Uh, the fourth category mentioned in the Quran it what is what is called mu'allafatu qulubuhum mu'allafatu qulubuhum and so these are we can call the sympathizers of islam to individuals who uh, it is said that when well, there are different interpretations of this some say that it means people who want to become muslim but uh, because of fear that if they become muslim they're going to be cut off from their tribe or their family and their wealth right and so zakat can be utilized for that reason to encourage them, uh, or it can be, it, it means individuals who actually, who actually incline towards Islam, and we hope that by giving them from the zakat, it actually might bring them closer, uh, bring them into the fold. Another interpretation of mu'allafa qulubuhum are individuals who actually have influence in society, 
uh, and they have influence over some of the much more um, negative and harmful elements of society, right? And we pay them in order to ward off the evil of those people, right? We pay them sort of like a protection money. Some see it that way. Uh, and so there are different interpretations of what's meant by this, right, in, uh, amongst the fuqaha. Uh, the fifth category is uh, al-riqab, as in the verse, and that is a slave. So the, the zakat money should be paid to free slaves, in particular believing slaves, Muslim slaves, that it can be utilized to do, to do that. And then a six for debtors, people who have incurred halal debts, halal um, debts, uh, then uh, the zakat money is to be paid uh, to in order to pay off those type of things. Uh, and then seventh, for war provisions for soldiers. And this is not talking about funding a um, military budget, right? This is not really, this is not what it means. It, 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 well, it's not what it meant in the early period of Islam. It didn't mean that. It, it meant, you know, for individuals who don't have enough uh, munitions or they don't have, let's say, for instance, a horse to ride to war or a sword or a shield or arrows, things like that, that the monies uh, or the wealth that is gathered, collected in zakat can be utilized to pay for that individual to make it into battle, right? You know, so at the time, once a battle happens, then, right, then you give them from zakat, not prior to that. Like, so for instance, today, when we start talking about military budgets, uh, it's something different. You say, well, we need money for the military. Okay, well, what, are you planning to war? You're about to go to war, right? So no, even if you're not at war, we still need the military budget to be a certain amount. Right, to pay for all the new different types of weapons that we're trying to, to create uh, to potentially, you know, eventually use against some people. Uh, but war provisions is mentioned in the, in the Quran. It, it says that this in the way of God. And this is originally with a reference to uh, jihad. And then lastly, the wayfarers. Right? So these are travelers, people uh, who are on the journey away from their homes. They may be cut off from their wealth uh, or they are cut off from their wealth. And in order to either return home or to continue their journey, uh, they can be given from zakat, according to the teachings of Islam, according to the teachings of Islam. And then he said in the final slide, uh, the final uh, two verses or four verses, however you'd like to count them, he says, zakat al-fitri sa'an wa tajib an muslimin wa man bi rizqihi tulib min muslimin bi juli aishi al-qawmi li tugli hurra musliman fil yomi. The zakat due at the end of the Ramadan fast is a saw. And it is compulsory from a Muslim and from those uh, he is ob obliged to pro provide for. From a Muslim, it is taken from the standard sustenance of the people to suffice a Muslim free person for the day. Right. So in other words, so zakat al-fitr, sometimes referred to as zakat al-abdan, which is also a compulsory type of zakat. Now, the earlier zakat we were talking about is often referred to as zakat al-amwal, which is the zakat due on property. Uh, this zakat, which is paid at the end of the month of Ramadan, zakat al-fitr, is paid on persons. In other words, you pay it on behalf of yourself and on behalf of all of your dependents. In the Maliki school, the men are obligated to pay this uh, and no one else. Right? You know, fathers pay for their children. Uh, and the um, and husbands paid for their wives, uh, or you paid, or for any other dependents in your home uh, at the time and who actually are poor, uh, they can't provide for themselves. It can be your parents as well. So, so, so what is due is what we call a saw, is a metric. Now, the saw is about two kilos, right, of of, of food, uh, and can be take the form of like things like cottage cheese or rice or dates or et cetera, et cetera, raisins. Uh, that those are examples of what uh, a, what what should be will be given, you know, for zakat al fitr. Uh, the Malikis uh, classically do not allow for one to pay the value, the monetary value of those things, even though it's become commonplace today that everyone has become default Hanafi on this particular point. Uh, and I, I don't personally don't see any reason why uh, a Muslim cannot uh, pay, pay this, you know. But um, it's it's something. You know, if people still differ and they're strict about it, it's not a problem. You know, I find it to be problematic. Uh, and so it is supposed to be paid, zakat al fitr is to be paid to a poor Muslim, right? A poor Muslim, not to a poor non Muslim, but to a poor Muslim. Uh, and it should be taken from what we call the Aisha qawm, the standard sustenance of the people. The standard sustenance, sustenance may be dates, it may be raisins, maybe may be cottage cheese, 
of course, of course, you're not going to use it and give it hamburgers, right? You know, because some people that are with their ice, you know, but that is not considered in our particular Sharia, you know, and so you're to give sufficiency to a free Muslim, meaning a non-slave for a single day. And so why is mentioned, why non-slave is mentioned is one, because of the times wherein the author was living, there was still slavery, still the norm. And then second of all, because the slave owner has an obligation to provide for his or her slave at the same time. At any rate, um, that's all we, um, we, we covered today. You know, I'm looking forward to your questions. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he bless you all. Uh صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Okay, bismillah. All right, so we're going to begin with a, a few questions uh, we have here. Uh, first question is, um, if you are the head of a corporation and you have cash in reserves for taxes, etc., uh, do you count that as part of your own assets for collecting, for calculating as a cap? Right. So again, I'll read it again. So if you're the head of a corporation and you have cash in reserves for taxes, etc., do you count that as part of your own assets for calculating your zakat? Um, if, if, if zakat is due right at the time uh, and you haven't paid your taxes yet, then yes, you would, right? Because what's, the, the, what's important here is that uh, it's, it's available, right? It's available, what, whatever you pay zakat on, whatever is available, whatever your surplus is at the moment, right? Now, having cash in reserves you know, is understandable that a person would have cash in reserves um, to pay you know, taxes for, for the government, right? But zakat itself is based upon what you have in the surplus. And, and the blessing of Islam is that um, once you have enough wealth to pay zakat on it, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not obligate you to cling to that wealth, yeah. meaning that if you choose to spend that, you know, it's fine, right? As long as it's not become due. So, but, but once it becomes due, you have to pay on it. You have to pay on whatever is available. If the tax itself is a debt, which is not due yet, it doesn't matter, right? You know, because, you know, um, you have to wait until that, that debt is due. If it's due, then yes, you pay, excuse me, you pay your taxes and then you pay your zakat from what remains. Right, you know, so so as long as the tax not due, uh, you are required to pay zakat on what is available in your surplus on your savings. Uh, another question is: Can zakat be given in the form of food in the Malki school? Well, zakat ideally um, would be given in the form of food on the food that one. Uh, uh, possesses as farm produce, right? So if you have farm produce, then zakat, you pay from that food. Uh, if you have livestock, then you pay livestock, right? And you pay zakat in the form of livestock. If you own cash, then you pay, um, you pay zakat in the form of cash. Uh, but of course, it sounds like the question is, say, what if I don't want to pay cash? I have enough, I have cash, right, savings, right? And instead of me paying the cut from my cash and I pay in food, I would say that my understanding is that no, you're not allowed to do so, uh, that you would, you would pay the cut from the form 
of uh, wealth that you possess because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated zakat on only specific types of wealth. And as long as you own one of those particular types of wealth, then you are obligated to pay from that particular type of wealth uh, of the same species, right, to the recipient, right? not to simply alter and say, well, I don't trust that person is going to be able to manage the wealth, you know, so I'm just going to give them food rather than giving them uh, giving them the cash, you know, and, and some people may utilize this as a way of evading zakat by saying, okay, well, I have a lot of food in stock, right, you know, some overdue food, some, some old food, and, you know, I'm going to save the cash that I have, right, you know, so I'm going to get rid of some of this food, right, so, so it's not to um, allow for people to circumvent the sharia, uh, I would say that that would be another reason that, which, that one would not be allowed to just simply give food in place of cash that is due. Uh, another question, if someone receives a cat and holds on, to it, holds on to it for a lunar year, putting him above the nisab amount the year after, does he have to pay the cat on it? Yes. Like if you have savings, right, regardless of how they came to you, uh, if you continue to have those savings after a year of receiving them and the amount that you have, it reaches the nisab then you're obligated to pay your 2.5% on it. It doesn't matter that it was given in zakat. Because this, what happens is that this becomes proof that you didn't need it. The fact that you still have it is proof that you didn't need it. So you now have to purify it by paying 2.5%. And it really doesn't matter uh, how uh, wealthy you are, right? You know, that, uh, you know, that you had an amount you know, in, in the savings and a whole year passed over it and you didn't do anything with it. You have to purify it. Uh, next question, can one buy non-essential items such as toys or a television for someone who is zakat el eligible and intend dispensing of the zakat that way? No, uh, because zakat is not due on toys and television, right? Uh, so zakat is due on cash, farm produce, and it is due on um, livestock, right? So, uh, so whatever type of... Um, property was a catable property that you own, you pay it from that type of property to the recipient. You know, if you want to just go ahead and buy someone a gift, you know, buy them a television, buy them some toys, she'll go right ahead. You know, that's just sadaqah. It wouldn't qualify as a cap. Um, is it permissible for a husband to pay zakat on his wife's behalf? Is it obligatory for him to do so? In the Malachi school, no, it's not. Um, it's not um, for her woman, it's not obligatory for a wife to pay zakat if she doesn't have any wealth. Right, zakat is, due, is an individual obligation that every single Muslim is to pay from their own personal wealth, uh, a, a husband from his personal wealth, a wife from her personal wealth, uh, and um, the, uh, the, uh, the individual um, um, uh, who owns the, the nisab uh, pays from that, and uh, no person is, has, has, can, um, can, can pay for it on their behalf. Um, if you are a student of knowledge with wealth above the nisab, do you pay zakat on it? Yes, you do. It doesn't matter if you're a student of knowledge. If you, if you have, again, um, you have the nisab, right? Uh, it's the savings. Um, your needs are taken care of. Um, and, um, and now uh, the time has come for you to pay zakat. You pay zakat on it. Right. It doesn't really matter what state you're in. You're a student of knowledge. And I understand the, what the point that the individual is trying to make is that, okay, well, um, I'm not working, right? And others are providing for me. Uh, the wealth that I have is given to me by others. Well, it really doesn't matter. You know, that, you know, if a husband were to give his wife um, wealth as well, right? And she eventually has an amount, a certain amount in zakat, she would still have to pay zakat, you know, um, well, if she reaches the nisab, she would still have to pay zakat on that wealth. It doesn't matter. If, she, if she's, work, she's not working, it doesn't matter. Right? So the same thing would apply to students of knowledge. How does one pay zakat on gold they were gifted if one has no income or cash equivalent? Well, the gold itself, first and foremost, has to reach the nisab. Right? So if the gold that you have been given, it, uh, it reaches, it's, it's, it's 85 grams or more and a year passes by and you haven't utilized that gold for anything like jewelry. Let's say, for instance, we're talking about gold here, which like jewelry, or let's say it was gold bullion, right? The same thing. 
um, that if you're not utilizing it, it's just sitting, just sitting there, um, then you have to pay zakat on it. Right. If it's jewelry and you're utilizing it, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to pay zakat on it. Uh, if it's bullion, you know, it's like, for instance, somebody purchased you like as an investment, you know, stock, for instance, in gold, right? Then you have to pay zakat on it, right? It doesn't matter, right? Because again, you haven't utilized it, you haven't spent it. And so it really doesn't matter that people have gifted it to you. If one has invested money, does one pay on the amount invested or the current market value? So if one has invested money, does one pay on the amount invested or the current market value? The person would pay on the market value after uh, a year has passed, right? In, in the sense that, okay, you're, you're, talk, you're paying on profit, right? So let's say you invested money in something uh, and you earned profit on that investment. Um, if that profit is equal to a nisab uh, after a year, um, let's say if it's, again, it's worth 85 grams of gold, uh, then you pay zakat on it. Um, and so that's fundamentally how, how you know, I would answer that. Um, so it wouldn't base it on like uh, the amount you invested, it based it upon the amount that is worth, right, at the end of the year. Can one pay zakat monthly, subtracting it from the total amount owed? For the Malikis, no. You can't, cannot, not allowed to pay uh, zakat monthly because you're not obligated to pay it. So if you're not obligated, and the Malikis also say that if you're not obligated, it's not valid as well. Right? It's also not valid. If it's not, it's not compulsory, then it's also not valid. So think of this like prayer. Like, you know, I'm going to pray Dhuhr before it comes in, right? right? If you pray Dhuhr before Dhuhr comes in, then your Dhuhr is not valid. It doesn't, you know, because it has a certain time that it is, uh, is, is expected for you to fulfill it. Uh, and similar to this will be with regard to zakat. The zakat is paid once it's compulsory, right? And, and that is after a year of, of, the, of the money passing over the nisab. Uh, um, and so and at that point, then you pay it. So you don't pay it monthly. The Madikis don't allow that. Do large debts like the, a mortgage or student loans affect how much is owed in zakat? It affects it only if your plan is to pay it off prior to uh, zakat becoming obligatory. If you want to pay off the entire amount, then yeah, you're, it, it, it will probably wipe you out, right? And I'll imagine that. And then you become an individual who does not have to pay zakat, right? Most likely, you know. Um, but, uh, but if that's not your plan, then having a mortgage or a student loan has no effect on your obligation to pay zakat. Right. Um, it all depends on how much you have at the time, your, 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 your surplus, your savings at the time. Uh, then um, if you have no surplus, that's a different thing altogether. You know? But if you have a surplus, you pay on it. Right. So unless you're planning to pay it off in full um, or or you start planning to pay off a certain amount of it, which would reduce your savings below the NISAB, you know, then there's no reason to think that you would be exempt from paying the cut. Uh, the best time to give zakat, what is the best time to give zakat? Well, the best time to give zakat is when it's due, I guess I would say. All right, and that's after uh, a year has passed. Um, and um, for zakat al-fitr, for instance, it said that the best time to give, pay zakat al-fitr at the end of Ramadan is prior to Salat al-Eid right, of the following day. Right? But you can start any time from after Maghrib, at, at the, at, at the, you know, the, the Hilal for Shawal has, has been cited all the way until prior to uh, the Salat itself. And some say that it's better to give it closer to the time of the prayer than, uh, than earlier. Right, but with regard to your normal Zakat, your Rukni, Zakat Rukniya, that which is a pillar of Islam, then the best time it paid is when it is due. Um, can we give Zakat to build or repair public hospitals or schools? Uh, the, the vast majority, the, the dominant view in the Malikis is that no, that you can't utilize the zakat monies to, to repair schools uh, or, or hospitals or build hospitals or build bridges, et cetera, et cetera. You're not allowed to do it, utilize for those type of things. Uh, even though, you know, they probably find some uh, contemporary fatwas which do allow that, but classical fiqh does not allow for you to do so. If a needy relative would find it offensive if asked if they are zakat el eligible, but we want to support them through zakat, how can we verify that they are zakat eligible? Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> I guess you have to ask them or find a way to, uh, to probe uh, their personal um, 
uh, expenses and, and income, uh, you have to find some other way around to do it. You know, I don't know any way other than to ask them or to find someone who has that particular knowledge of it. Um, so if you don't know, then it's better for you not to give to someone that you have doubt about. And this is uh, actually one of the things that Ibn Asha says at the, that final verse, وَلَمْ uh, murib, And the, the suspicious person, the person we have doubt about, the estate, we don't give zakat to them. Uh, is zakat due on jewelry that a person normally wears? No, zakat is not due on the jewelry that a person normally wears. Um, is zakat due on diamonds and precious jewels? No, zakat is not due on diamonds and precious jewels unless you sell them. If these are things that you sell and you make a profit from them, then zakat, you know, we do on the profits made from them when uh, attached with the other uh, wealth that you have or other savings that you have. If they equal nisab, then you will have to pay on it. But not, you know, zakat is not mentioned in the, either the Quran or the Hadith as being subject to zakat. The, I mean, uh, diamonds and precious jewels are not mentioned as being subject to zakat in any of our sources. Can zakat be given to fund public campaigns to turn people's hearts towards Islam and Muslims? Um, oh, political campaigns. I'm sorry, political campaigns. Uh, no, <laughs> the zakat cannot be utilized to fund political campaigns. Uh, uh, political campaigns don't generally turn people's hearts towards Islam and Muslims. In my, in our experience, from what I can tell, uh, if anything, uh, what what those things do, what's happened is the opposite. That Muslims' hearts seem to be turned towards uh, the political campaigns, and rather than the opposite, you know, I don't see many Muslims working in politics. Politics who actually are even trying to convince people to become Muslim, right? Uh, uh, so, if anything, is the Muslims have been converted the opposite in the opposite direction. Right? So, I don't see any reason to offer a fatwa that says that Muslims can give to a political campaign, uh, claiming that they uh, the, the desire is to bring people closer to Islam when Muslims who are involved in politics for the most part are actually not even trying to bring people to Islam, that they actually are calling to the same thing that others are calling to. Is zakat due on one 401k? How is it calculated? Now, the issue of 401k is, um, is a bit uh, nuanced and involved in that uh, a 401k, uh, well, put it like this. I, I like to give people a, a basic rule that you apply. Earlier, we talked about different types of trade debts, right? Um, uh, 401k are basically are, you know, monies being saved, they're being invested in certain types of stock uh, in hopes to make the wealth grow. Now, the a trade, trade and necessity goods, as mentioned before, is trade and goods that are on a, on a rotating basis, that these are goods that are constantly being replenished in one's um, inventory, you know, but, you know, a 401k is much more in line with what we call uh, a sort of trade in necessity goods. And that is to say that, at least I, I personally feel that way, uh, in that um, these are things which are being placed um, uh, in, and uh, money has been invested in these items with the hope that long for long term growth. Uh, and what, and so basically what happens is that there are certain legal limitations placed upon the individual who has uh, retirement wealth or uh, or four five four one k wealth, such that if you were to take money out of it, then there would be penalties involved. Right now, of course, one opinion is that uh, that you do pay zakat on four one k every single year, similar to why uh, similar to paying zakat on your um, trade and necessity goods, uh, and that um, you know there's a certain amount of wealth you're allowed to extract from your 401k, uh, even though there are penalties involved. So you subtract the penalties and the tax that goes along with it, and you would pay on the amount that's left over, you know, that you are allowed to actually take out. Right. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, um, there's an opinion that states that because you don't have complete control over your wealth, right. And so, and this is this particular company uh, or your broker is not allowing for you to take out or to cash out all the money that they say uh, belongs to you. Uh, that fundamentally means that you don't have complete control over something which is supposed to be yours, right? So that would technically put you in a different category. And so that other opinion would be that you would not pay any zakat on uh, 401ks until you actually uh, get payment from it, that you do take extracts from money from it. 
right? Uh, and Alano's best with the proper view is, seems to me that probably the, 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 the view that you only pay on it when you take something out would be the appropriate analogy rather than the one that said that you would pay, take pay on it every single year. Allahu Akbar. Can you give the cut to your parents? You can give the cut to your parents if your parents are poor. If your parents are poor, meaning they don't have income. Um, well, put it like this. Um, well, I'm sorry, I take that back. No, you can't give zakat on your parents because your parents are among your dependents, right? If they're poor. That's what I meant to say, actually, <laughs> not to say what I said earlier before. So you don't, you can't pay zakat to your parents because if your parents are poor, then you're obligated to provide for them in the same way that you're obligated to provide for your children or your wife, right? So you can't give it to your parents. You can give it to a friend like an uncle or a cousin uh, or a brother or sister, right? Because they are not your dependents, uh, but you can't give it to your parents. Can zakat, be, can zakat be used to repay the debts of the deceased? Um, no, right? The debts of the deceased are to be paid um, from their estate, whatever they have left over. If anything, zakat is a form of debt. If a person hasn't been, uh, hasn't um, uh, paid zakat on wealth at the time that he or she dies, then one of the first things that's taken from their estate is the zakat money, right? Is zakat wealth. Uh, um, any sort of um, uh, restitution that you owe to individuals who you hurt and you're harmed physically, for instance, that's taken away from it as well, right? And then what follows that is your funeral costs and then, then debts are paid and then you're paid, uh, you do whatever bequest that you make to people and then that's followed by miras that we call inheritance uh, money is then uh, given out to the, to the heirs, right? So so zakat is among, among the first things that is to be taken from a person's wealth upon dying. Right. So, so zakat um, uh, uh, is not to be used to pay debt, or rather it is a debt owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, um, and, and so unless we say that by to pay a debt, uh, we could pay someone else's debt with zakat. That money that is given from you can be used to pay someone else's debt, but not to pay your own debt. Um, what should one do if they missed payment of zakat al-fitr in the past on behalf of themselves or their dependents? Then they just pay it. You make it up, simple. You just pay it later on when you, when you, when you get it. Uh, if someone has farmland but has given it to relatives for cultivation and to earn from it, are they still responsible for the zakat on the farm income? Well, so we're talking about a situation where one particular person owns the corpus of the of the of the farm and the other you owns you sort of earns owns the usufruct of it. The uh, there's no zakat due on farmland, but there's zakat due on farm produce, right? So, you know, like for instance, you don't have to pay zakat on your house or your car, right? There's not there's no zakat due on that on those type of things to begin with. You know? But the individual who actually is um, growing crops, and if any of those crops that are being grown are um, zakatable, right? The types of crops that are considered to be subject to the rules of zakat, then one would pay zakat on those crops once they reach the zakatable minimum, which is nisab, as we mentioned before, it can be anything where between 450 kilos and 648 kilos or 650 kilos, depending on um, the, the calculation. Um, or what we in, in Arabic call five west courses, of 60 sides. Um, that's why I believe I finished that one. So, um, my masjid has a zakat collection box in the lobby. Can I give my zakat to the masjid or do I have to look for specific people who are zakat eligible? Well, if you are certain, excuse me, if you're certain that the, the, the masjid itself is properly dispensing the zakat to individuals who qualify as recipients of zakat, then, you know, why not? You can give it to them you know, if you trust that they are doing it legally uh, in the proper way and giving it to the people who deserve it, um, then go right ahead. You know? But if you don't believe that, then probably should give it uh, out personally. And it's the same thing that applies to governments. You know, there's Muslim governments uh, um, you know, they, they, in the, they, in the books of fiqh, generally we're supposed to give zakat to a Muslim governor, 
But our method teaches that if the governor is untrustworthy, it's not a just a just governor, then you don't give the zakat to them, that you give it only you get simply give it to the recipients yourself on your own. Right. So when you don't trust those who are administrating and dispensing and collecting the zakat, then you just simply give it out on your own. Is there a difference of opinion on the amount of zakat? 2.5%. Uh, with respect to gold and silver and currency, which is analogized with it, there's no difference of opinion on that 2.5%. Uh, but with regard to the other types of wealth, yes, of course, the other types of wealth like farm produce and livestock, they have their own percentages. Uh, so with regard to currency, there is no disagreement about uh, what's called ruba al ushur as is stated in the hadith of the Prophet you know, there's 2.5% to be paid on those things. Uh, can we give our zakat to street beggars? Well, I mean, if you believe that the street beggar is it qualifies as one of the recipients of zakat and there's no reason for you to doubt that, then yes, sure. You know, but with the condition that the person is a Muslim. <laughs> All right, so, so you have to ascertain that the person is a Muslim uh, in, in order for you to give zakat to them. You, know, you can't give the zakat to a non-Muslim. Um, and, uh, you know, so that would, um, so that would be, uh, be a situation there. How do you define what? Nisab. Um, well, the Nis right was the, the Malikis. How the the Malikis def define Nisab? And nisab can be translated as the zakatable um, minimum or the zakatable threshold uh, that one should possess prior to the obligation of paying the zakat. So, and that differs according to the type of wealth that we are trying to pay zakat on. So again, gold and silver and other types of gold, you know, gold and silver currency and uh, like jewelry, et cetera, that is 2.5%, you know, to be paid on, uh, which is actually the payout amount, we would say. Uh, but the nisab would be for gold is 85 grams and for silver is about 595 grams. Uh, and then we're just simply making an analogy on one or the other with regard to our cash, right? So if you use the gold standard, you know, whatever is equal to 85 grams of gold, that becomes your nisab. You know, if you're using silver, whatever is equal to 595 or 600 grams of silver, that's what your nisab is. Uh, with regard to pro produce, again, as we mentioned before, it's about an average of about 600 kilos of different types of grains or fruits. And with regard to livestock, depending on uh, the difference between camels and cows and um, uh, sheep and goat and goats um, it differs according to the number with regard to those so the saw will be, be different would be different depending on the different um, the different uh, types of property right that they're uh, due on so right so what if so questions like what if you have a joint account with one's wife um, how do you pay zakat in that situation uh, I would say that it depends on how you define joint. Right. So if joint is 50 50, then you base it upon that. Right. And so whatever, um, you know, uh, amount that is, uh, uh, you know, they, what is in the account in terms of savings after a year, then each particular spouse would base it upon whatever percentage that they're, they're said to own. Right. So that should be defined. Right. 50 50, 60 40. You know, that should be clear, you know, uh, um, to, to everyone. Um, and uh, so it would just simply work that way. So alhamdulillah, barakallahu fikum. Appreciate everyone tuning in and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he increase your wealth and your increase your generosity. On top of that, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you health and wealth and to grant you strong faith. We, we also uh, hope that uh, this will be a, a very blessed Ramadan for everyone, Ramadan Mubarak. Uh, and um, hopefully we'll see you during the month. And uh, please do give to Zaytuna College. Uh, we uh, can't survive without you. And uh, we do thank all of all, I thank all of you for your support over the years. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you in every good. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam 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 wa